Welcome everybody to the D3 3 conference. Today session uh, is going to be about uh, decentralized finance, DeFi as we call it, challenges and opportunities. So the D3 uh, conference is organized as part of the Digital Currency Global Initiative. Uh, so organized uh, uh, in collaboration with the International Telecommunication Union and uh, the Future of Digital Currency Initiative at Stanford University. Myself, uh, I'm the director of the Blockchain Certificate of Advanced Studies at the University of Geneva, and uh, I lead the stablecoins, DeFi, and NFT workstream of the DCGI. Uh, the DCGI has uh, three uh, main working groups, uh, policy and governance, architecture and interoperability and use cases, and security and assurance. And so today we are going to uh, talk about uh, decentralized finance, the challenges and opportunities. And we have uh, uh, a great list of speakers, experts in, in the domain. Uh, so the first speaker will be Kai Ganter, director of Chain Analysis. Chain Analysis is a, a major uh, provider for analyzing blockchains, which are needed for decentralized finance. Then we will have the view of uh, Roman Ametner, director of Regu regulatory affairs advocacy at Mastercard. Then we will have uh, Nadia Filali. Head of Blockchain and Crypto Assets Program at Caisse des Dépôts, uh, which is a major public uh, funding uh, body in France. And uh, finally, we we'll have uh, Lex uh, Sokolin, uh, Chief Crypto Economics Officer at Consensus, which is a very uh, well-known uh, company that started with, uh, with Ethereum uh, a good number of years ago. If you want to ask them questions, you can use either in Zoom, the Q&A tool um, that you, where you can uh, ask uh, questions and uh, the experts will uh, answer them either uh, directly in, in the tool or uh, after uh, when we, we talk uh, together. Uh, you have also a link to an application which is called the Pigeon, Pigeon Hall. And so uh, you can click on this uh, link to also uh, ask your questions. Uh, and then uh, it will be also used for, for questions and answers. So the, the first part, we'll have a, an introduction by each of the expert speakers. And so uh, the first uh, speaker is going to be Kai Gantner uh, from Chain Analysis. So uh, Kai, could you uh, introduce uh, a bit more yourself? Yeah, sure. Thanks for inviting me and thanks for having me. So my name is Kai. I'm leading the business efforts at Chainalysis um, yeah, for the region Switzerland, Liechtenstein and Austria, um, talking to both financial institutions and uh, public sector customers. As you probably know, if you heard about Chainalysis, we are closely co-working with law enforcement all over the globe and also with um, yeah, private institutions such as banks and so on. And um, yeah, I, I just want to highlight some of the opportunities and innovative um, applications that DeFi can bring to make financial services more efficient. So first of all, um, as you are probably pretty much aware, DeFi can increase the accessibility and this is really one huge opportunity as it can provide financial services to individuals who may have been excluded from traditional financial systems due to lack of credit history or identification or other reasons. So this will be a massive game changer for, um, yeah, for poor countries or um, yeah, people who didn't have access uh, to financial services before. Um, also, on the other hand side, DeFi will reduce costs as there will be no need for intermediaries, which for sure will lower the costs um, for, for the users overall. And another benefit I personally see, and this is also what we are helping our customers with at Genalysis, is a greater transparency with DeFi 
all transactions are recorded on a public available blockchain. Um, and with that, this increases the transparency and also the trust in the financial system, which is a huge benefit. Um, and then also we will have more efficient markets as decentralized exchanges can increase market liquidity and reduce spreads, making it easier for users to buy and sell assets. Also on the other hand side, um, there are already loads of new financial products and we will definitely see this during the course of the, of the year that there are many, many, um, yeah, great ideas and projects going on as decentralized lending, for example, or borrowing platforms, stable coins, yield borrowing as, uh, sorry, yield bearing assets, for example, um, which are already great financial products, which haven't been there before. Um, also on the yeah, processual side, DeFi can automate processes and reduce human errors, therefore, which also will increase the efficiency. And last but not least, and this is also a topic where Genalysis comes in and have a main focus on is a, a better risk management as DeFi um, definitely can enable better risk management as the smart contracts can be programmed to automatically execute actions based on predefined conditions. Um, yeah, and this will, will ha help the overall ecosystem. Yeah, just my few cents on the opportunities of, of DeFi. Um, thanks. Thanks. Uh, we'll go uh, back to, to questions uh, afterwards. So uh, the next speaker is Roman Abentner from uh, MasterCard. Uh, he's uh, more into the regulations. And so please, uh, Roman, uh, uh, give us uh, an introdu introduction to, to your view on this uh, topic. Thanks. Yeah, thank you very much, Mark, and um, also thanks for having me. Um, I'm working actually in MasterCard's regulatory advocacy uh, globally, and so, um, yeah, we are, of course, uh, watching DeFi developments over the last few years uh, quite closely, also with a view of, uh, you know, seeing how we might be able to include those in our future business activities. Um, and, you know, our view is really, uh, at the moment, it's, it's a rather a mix of uh, excitement, but also caution. Uh, as Kai already mentioned, uh, DeFi certainly has a lot of potential, uh, just to mention, you know, uh, cheaper, quicker transactions, uh, easier access to financial uh, transactions or services. And um, often as the main driver of this innovation is, of course, um, mentioned decentralization. Uh, so the removal of traditional centralized intermediaries. And, you know, just from, from that perspective, we think that there should be actually a bit more analysis into decentralization aspects and, and the value proposition stemming from that um, in terms of DeFi. Since, you know, if you look at current DeFi applications and platforms, uh, there's really a lot that, that drives innovation in these, in these sort of packages. So you have uh, automation of processes, uh, such as through smart contracts. Uh, you have, uh, for example, tokenization of assets, which certainly uh, brings a lot of value. And then, of course, you have very uh, a broad range of uh, different decentralization models. So, um, you know, just speaking of uh, the governance of DeFi um, applications, for instance, uh, we can really see up until now a very broad range of how decentralized or sometimes also centralized these models are. And um, yeah, for example, if you look at um, you know who holds, uh, if, if developers, for example, retain administrative keys, and therefore can um, more or less by themselves rewrite smart contracts, that's actually then not so decentralized as, as we might think and as the name DeFi often suggests. So that's really something we need to uh, you know, have um, a closer look at. Um, as this will be uh, quite crucial also for the development of DeFi and its evolution and its, its overall potential. Um, yeah, having said that, um, so we see a lot of opportunities, but uh, of course, there's also a bit of caution. Um, I think we've all, you know, heard and, and wrote uh, about the, the, the various attacks that have happened um, and that went, unfortunately, hand in hand also with the growth of DeFi. Um, there was yeah, quite a lot of fraudulent attacks. There was um, sometimes also uh, technological errors in, in DeFi applications. 
Um, even um, state-supported hacking groups have been involved in, in, in uh, carrying out hacks or, or um, uh, fraud. So, for example, North Korea's Lazarus group. And, um, yeah, that eventually then also led to not just, you know, lots of losses for, for consumers, which is definitely a very negative aspect, but also um, to, to circumvention of sanctions, um, um, perhaps. So this is really uh, something we would need to overcome to make DeFi overall grow um, safely and sustainably and to increase trust in the system. Um, yeah, speaking of which, uh, I think also what, what we can see so far now is that um, KYC AML protocols are, um, you know, not always uh, very well, um, you know, practiced in DeFi applications. So that's perhaps another area of, of caution and where we see uh, urgent needs of, of um, improvements. Uh, yeah, I think from my introductory statement, I just wanted to make sure that uh, yeah we, we see this with mixed feelings. And last but not least, actually, um, I wanted to add, but I will come back to that later, that if you discuss DeFi and its, and its potential, you really also have to have an eye on uh, stablecoins and the roles they play in this ecosystem. Um, up until now, stablecoins are really broadly used as a kind of substitute for fiat currencies in the DeFi space. And so therefore, you know, risk factors are also closely interlinked. So if we really want to help DeFi take off um, and, and bring out the, the good innovation, then we also have to have, um, you know, proper stablecoin um, regulation of stablecoins in place. Yeah. Thanks, so, uh, thanks, thanks, Roman, for your, your view. Uh, we, we have already published a technical report uh, on stablecoins, actually, for, from the, the work we have done as part of the DCGI work stream on stablecoins. So uh, it's a public report, so uh, members can uh, can access it, and uh, I think also other, other public uh, people interested in this topic. So next, um, thanks, uh, Roman. Next, uh, we have uh, Nadia Filali, so uh, as I said, head of blockchain and crypto assets program at Cas de Depot. She she uh, has participated to uh, uh, to push the, the ecosystem in France, and uh, the Caisse de Depot has also uh, participated to to invest in, in some of these uh, innovative uh, use cases. So she's going to give us uh, an, introdu an introduction to to the use cases that uh, she has uh, dealt with. Thanks. Uh, Thank you, Jean-Marc. Uh, and hi everyone. Uh, yes, yeah, so Caisse de Depot is a very old uh, company. We are um, uh, launched by Napoleon in 1814 or 1816, so it's a very old company and it's a public group, it's a financial public group, so it's something uh, like um, a bank of development in, in France, but not working uh, uh, only in uh, in financing the, the regions, but also we have a, a, a part of uh, asset management for us or for the government, and uh, we uh, have also some subsidiaries in transportation, like Transdev, uh, in uh, real estate, in insurance, and and many things. So we are a large group and. As you said, uh, Jean-Marc, we, we work on the subject of blockchain and crypto assets uh, to trying to push the ecosystem in, in France uh, in the beginning with a lab chain, with a consortia in, uh, in finance, with banks and startups. And we continue uh, to work on that also by launching INADBA. In at, um, it's an association in, uh, based in Brussels that I have the chance uh, to be the chair of the board from uh, one year now, and we are working in different subjects. And as a really public in financial institution, um, working on, on the subject of, uh, of crypto asset and, uh, and blockchain is not really uh, easy. And, uh, but we began to work uh, really practically on, on crypto asset by being a, a custodian in France. For, uh, for a big public institution. So we have the, the, the status of, of, what, of French CAPS, uh, the PSAN. And we work also on the security token side because for us, we think that the tokenization of financial assets is something that uh, will exist in the, in the future. 
uh, talking about DeFi uh, make us we think that there is different opportunities in the DeFi innovation. Uh, in the, for example, uh, concerning the loans or the access of uh, the saving or uh, or financing the economy by different uh, type of, of, of people. Because for uh, I don't know if you know, but we have only uh, six percent of the French population who, who had uh, security in France. And uh, it's less than, than people who had crypto asset. It's 10% on the crypto asset. And uh, financing the economy by uh, financing company uh, through the security, I think it's uh, really important. So DeFi provides some, something more easier for the consumer to, to go to uh, finance and companies. And uh, also because the, not only because the access of, 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 uh, of the DeFi, but also because you can finance uh, smallest project or buy half of, uh, of uh, security or things like this. So it could be a, really a, an opportunity for, for the economy to, to go on that. And uh, the point is for the moment for a large institution, financial institution for uh, like us, it's difficult to go on DeFi not only because of the volatility, the volatility on crypto, or the, the, the people know the, the point, but there is other constraints on the on DeFi. That's the first one. It's the the identification of of your counterparties and the compliance um, subject. Because for the moment, if you are a big bank or an institution like us, you are submitted to some rules and the regulatory rules. And you, you need to do your KYC, you need to do your KYT here, because it's different. And uh, for the moment, it's not really secure on, on that point. But we trust also uh, because of the, the development of the, the SSI of, on the self-sovereign identity and, and the, perhaps with the, the European wallet, the e-wallet, perhaps this kind of constraints be, will be um, different in, in some years. Another, another point that it's really important, I think it's really linked with the, the, the conference, is that uh, there is a point on the, on the, the management of, uh, of the payment. So for the moment, we find some stable coins in the, in the DeFi. We saw that there is some, some problem with uh, some of them last, uh, in, the, in the last summer. And, um, perhaps that the, that if we can use CBDC on DeFi, for example, could be more easier for institutional to go there and to manage some transaction uh, in the in the DeFi. Perhaps another uh, constraint. <laughs> it's not it's not only a constraint. It's that the uh, for institution for for a C, for um, uh, um, for the banks and the 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 CFI, the, for the TradFi, uh, sorry, um, going on DeFi, it's something uh, perhaps bizarre for people who uh, are intermediaries on financial services to go on a system that uh, decentralized the TradFi. So I think there is also fear to go on on, on this subject. But as we saw in the in the young story of, of fintech of, and, uh, and digital innovation, it's that it's it's a better uh, it's a better issue to uh, work with the people who are doing the innovation that working against this innovation. It was true for open banking. It was true for for uh, also for. Um, for other kind of innovation. So I think there is a, a, a way that make us work together, but we need to, uh, to work also on the, the content, uh, really on, on compliance and this, this, uh, this matter on the, on the cash management and, um, and the volatility. Okay, thanks. We have already a number of questions. Uh, we'll ask the questions uh, later. Thanks, uh, Nadia, for this. You're welcome. 
Then uh, next uh, we have uh, so Lex uh, so, so Colin from uh, Consensus, and so he is going to give us uh, his view on this topic. Thanks, Lex. Sure. Uh, thanks so much for for having me. It's a pleasure to be uh, with the group. I think lots of good points made already. Um, so my name is Lex. I'm um, uh, at Consensus, where I've had uh, a number of roles uh, from. Uh, running crypto economics to previously running marketing and and before that running uh, all of our fintech product um, and um, kind of prior in the adventure I, I was in the um, uh, in the fintech space building out digital investing companies and uh, started my career at Lehman so um, have the existential crisis of a failed financial institution under my belt as well as the scar tissue of actually running a company and knowing what that feels like. Um, and and um, I think that this is a really difficult topic without feeling the the actual experience of having ever used uh, a crypto wallet or ever uh, invested in a DeFi protocol. It's hard for me to do a poll of the audience of you know how many of you um, have actually owned a stable coin or uh, staked something in a, in a uh, protocol. And and I think a lot of um, emotion and pushback and skepticism can be resolved by mere usage. So if anything, I would just encourage people to go grab the MetaMask wallet and, um, you know, put a, a hundred euro to work to understand what's actually going on. Um, as it gets to consensus, we're a company uh, focused on uh, supporting and enabling Web3. So we're not a financial company, we're a technology company. As Google relates to search and the internet, we relate to the architecture underneath Web3 and everything that entails. Um, we have two primary motions. The first motion is to help people use Web3, and I'll keep using that term Web3. I'm happy to open that up. Uh, Web3 includes uh, the usage of decentralized finance as well as the usage of other uh, smart contracts-based software that is written onto blockchains, that is executed on blockchains, and that has uh, the attributes of economic scarcity and um, uh, decentralization as, as core uh, to their functioning. But anyway, so the one thing we do is we help people use Web3 uh, through MetaMask, which is a crypto wallet uh, with about 30 million monthly average users. So lots of people um, are doing stuff. And then the second thing that we do is help developers build on Web3 so that there are things people can do. Um, and that means providing infrastructure, developer infrastructure. That means helping set up and run protocols, things like Quorum for JP Morgan or the Palm Network for NFT issuance, as well as contributing to the core Ethereum network. Um, and so that's the motion, create the ecosystem and help people use the ecosystem. And then both sides of that equation are open, meaning that there are plenty of other companies that make wallets and there are plenty of other companies that provide developer tools and everything in between. So that's the, the very biased context that I'm coming from. Uh, I think if you um, try to just create a cartoon story of what's happened, um, it's, it's pretty straightforward. And I'll, I'll describe it in the way that I've transitioned into the industry and how I've self-persuaded about why, um, why this is important and interesting. And you can now tell that I'm like trapped in the metaverse and uh, it's too late for me. Uh, maybe some of you are still safe on, on the earth, but I'm in the fractal universe. It's too late. Okay. So, um, you know, if you think about the traditional financial services industry, um, you can think of it as an extension of the real economy, right? You, you, you have about 20% of GDP, give or take, um, in finance. If you have too much, we're over-financialized, too many derivatives, you know, shut the bankers down. If you have too little, then it's a problem. Uh, people are underbanked. There's no access to finance or credit. Entrepreneurs suffer, right? So there's some sort of magic finance as percent of economy number, which floats anywhere between 10 and 20%. Um, the, without a real economy, you just have financial engineering. Um, in, in our Wall Street world, um, the, the value chain starts with manufacturing financial products. And then that financial product is pushed through some sort of intermediation chain and distributed uh, to individuals, right? So you have large sales forces of financial advisors, you have large 
bank uh, branch footprints and so on. In the next wave recently, certainly there are many technology waves in the space, but in the next wave, in the fintech wave, uh, the Silicon Valley approach to building consumer first financial, uh, consumer first mobile products um, was applied to finance. So all of a sudden, you take all those bank branches, you take all those financial advisors, you take all of those digital lending officers, uh, you cross them out and you fire them, and you replace them with a phone and a website. And roughly speaking, that's what's happened. It's not exactly what happened, but roughly speaking, the storefront of financial products has shifted to the phone and to the web. And you see that with neobanks and digital advisors and uh, digital lending companies and paytech companies, you know, Venmo, Cash App, Revolut, Robinhood, and so on. Um, so fintech has given us digital distribution, but it's given us digital distribution of traditional product. We're still faxing and papering and scanning and doing human labor to manufacture those products. And so the, the next phase that's already happened, it's already done, um, is to manufacture financial products in a way that's fundamentally different. So this is one of the things that blockchain is good for. It's not the only thing, but it's one of the things. And so DeFi allows us to make any financial product, whether it's a payment or a banking product or a lending product or a capital markets product or a wealth management product or an insurance product, because it's made of software, um, in, a, in a, let's say, computationally native way not in a way that's, that's sort of glued together out of lots of different systems, but in a way that's native um, to, uh, to a computing system that melts all this stuff together. And so DeFi has shown us uh, it, with very real examples and pretty large distribution that we can have these financial products. It's also shown us that financial crises happen everywhere and they look the same and they have the same shape. And so we shouldn't be surprised. And so now we're in a place where we have both the manufacturing and the distribution of financial products digitally. Um, and the outstanding question for me and, and that I'm focused on is um, what, what is the point of finance uh, when it's so freely available and how does it enhance um, the, the real world economy and the Web3 economy? And so at this stage, we're seeing a lot of development in uh, the, the organization of labor, the organization of decentralized autonomous organizations, which are kind of small businesses in Web3 um, that are ending up using these Web3 financial systems instead of the traditional financial system, because that's where uh, people go and that's where they contribute. So that's, that's a very short version of a very long story. Um, hopefully you imagined it. Uh, and I'm happy to open up any of these things via questions. Yes, thanks. Uh, thanks, Lex, for this introduction. Uh, myself, um, so I, um, I noted a few questions already. Uh, so let me ask a few questions to, to start with the question and answers. Uh, I remind the audience that you, they can use the Q&A uh, tool on, on Zoom or the Pigeon Hall, uh, which is uh, shared, uh, uh, an application shared that you can use as well for question and answers. Um, so if we go back to Kai, Kai, uh, so you you talked about a, a good number of uh, issues um, and also some opportunities. So could you uh, summarize the challenges that that you, that you see regarding uh, decentralized finance, DeFi? Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, actually. I mean, still with all the enthusiasm and opportunity which um, DeFi brings, there are still some challenges. <laughs> and some of them have been already mentioned by, by Roman and the other panelists. But maybe the major ones from, from my perspective um, are uh, yeah, the, the lack of regulation, basically, since DeFi is relatively new and also rapidly evolving. There's currently, from my point of view, a lack of clear regulatory guidance for many of the activities which, which are taking place in, in, in the DeFi space. Um, and this also, on the other hand, can create uncertainty for, for users and make it difficult for projects to comply with existing laws and regulations. Um, also, yeah, maybe a an, an, an major issue 
could be or is, yeah, however you, you see this, um, the, the smart contract security. So as you know, DeFi relies heavily on smart contracts, um, which are self-executing contracts with the terms of the agreement between buyer and seller being directly written into lines of code. Um, however, smart contracts have been known to have bugs and vulnerabilities, um, which can, at the end of the day, result in the loss of funds for users, which is, <laughs> yeah, would be a, a main issue for, for users and the acceptance of, of DeFi protocols. And then also um, more from an ecosystem perspective, um, the liquidity is also another topic um, I thought about. Um, as many DeFi projects currently have low trading volume and liquidity, and this can make it difficult for users to buy or sell assets at fair prices, um, which then also can make it more difficult for projects to attract new users and grow the ecosystem. Um, I think these are the, the, the main ones um, I, I just thought about, yeah, some of the challenges we might okay. face. Yes, thanks. So, of course, you, you underline and others underline also a number of acts and, and uh, issues that happened uh, recently, uh, where lots of people uh, lost uh, a big amount of money. Uh, and we know that channel analysis, uh, you know, uh, uh, as a tool to track, uh, you know, what happens on the, on the blockchain. So, of course, uh, it has been used uh, to, to try to, to track the, the bad guys and what happened. But uh, could you tell us a bit more? Of, you know, in the future, how, how you see the, the role of, of chain analysis? Uh, uh, do you have new uh, new services as well, extended the features? Yeah, sure. I mean, and this, uh, and from our perspective, for sure, and I'm biased here, <laughs> uh, blockchain analysis will play a, will play a key uh, part in the future, uh, also within DeFi. And we are already addressing them with, with some of our products. And if you think about um, yeah, smart contract uh, transactions or smart contract based transactions uh, like NFT transfers or so, I mean, we are already, and this is kind of a no brainer, <laughs> we are already aware of every blockchain native transaction. Um, but um, yeah, with the likes of smart contracts and NFT transfers or other DeFi protocols, it's, it's a little bit more difficult and more complex as the timeline where a transaction is happening is um, one of the key um, factors where you would, would look at um, to understand how often a smart contract has been triggered, um, how often a NFT has been traded and so on, and in which time, timely manner. And um, we are already addressing some of these yeah, questions, which also uh, are coming from, from police, from law enforcement, um, when they are tracking down um, large NFT um, yeah, related crime cases and so on. So. I don't know if, I mean, one of our products is Storyline to mention here, which actually absolutely addresses this, these, these questions and will play a key role in the um, investigation and compliance um, in the DeFi space, yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah thanks. Uh, yeah, talking about, so moving towards compliance in the decentralized finance space, uh, Nadia, you you underlined that um, that uh, maybe uh, you said that uh, you, you think that uh, central banks digital currencies, which are uh, detailed in, in other sessions, and with, where uh, the DCGI also work on, uh, could uh, coexist with decentralized finance. So I mean, you, you know, having CBDCs in decentralized finance. Could you try to explain us a bit more uh, how it could work? Nadia? Sorry, I was, I was unmuted. So, sorry. 
I saw that there is a question on that, and we saw that there is the, the subject on Terra Luna this, uh, this year. Um, and really, if we want to, to try to, uh, to work on, on the issue to, to have uh, something that is more stable in our transaction and uh, in, the, in the cash, uh, I will say the cash leg because I'm, I'm working a lot on security, but on the cash uh, uh, part, um, working on, on stable, on algorithmic stable coin, I think it's not, uh, it's not a good issue and there is no guarantee and, and stability. Uh, so, uh, could be used uh, uh, stablecoin issue by uh, by some private company that uh, need to be uh, a little bit huge to be uh, to have uh, the, the the great guarantee on, on fiat money. And uh, after saying that, I think that there is two possibilities: using CBDCs or using um, what. Uh, we try to, to work on it in case the depot. It's the it's a, a commercial uh, a commercial bank uh, currency. We work, for example, on the commercial interbank digital currency uh, on that because that we know that the guarantees and the the the, 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 the token will bake on the on a, a great level of uh, of uh, of guarantee. For example, if it's, uh, for sure, if it's, if it's the, the central bank, but also uh, if it's a, a combination of, of big banks or, or one big institution. And working on that could be interesting because, uh, as we said, that there is problem on, uh, on the, there is some DeFi on the DeFi, if I, <laughs> I could say it like this, uh, because DeFi is it's too risky and too difficult for many financial institutions, and uh, because of the lack of uh, identity solution or, or anti-money laundering and and etc. But if you can use, I said if you can, because I don't know if if the central bank will uh, agree to use their uh, their CBDC in the DeFi. It's it's another point. Uh, and so, if you can use uh, CBDC or, or commercial bank uh, digital currency in the DeFi, uh, you will first uh, legitimize, I think, the, the DeFi more than today for some uh, corporate actors or uh, asset manager or banks, uh, because you will limit one of the, the essential risks there. You can perhaps try to um, to make more interoperability between the different system, and I think that um, one of, of the the points that uh, we need to focus on it's it's not only the interoperability between uh, the the different uh, blockchain that you can use or layer that you can use, but also the interoperability because between TradFi and DeFi. And perhaps that could be a, a good bridge for, uh, for that. Um, and uh, another point is that uh, uh, the, if we want, we want to make move some consumers or some investors uh, from TradFi to, to DeFi, uh, their capacity to invest or their capacity to uh, to or of saving will be the same. So it will be some kind of arbitrage between between the two, and we need to help up to pass from one world to the other world really easily. I think I don't know if you agree with that, Mr. Jean-Marc. <laughs> I said the uh... same. Yeah, I mean, uh, that's interesting also. I think maybe the, the first CBDC or the first uh, country uh, which will try to, to bridge, you know, uh, traditional finance or at least uh, its uh, central uh, bank currency with DeFi could uh, get an edge uh, compared mm. to, to other uh, uh, currencies. So, I mean, in, in a world where there is no not only one currency, major currency, maybe, mm. uh, so, uh, you know, uh, uh, give an advantage to the first mover. Mm. 
Um, yes, and then, then, uh, then if you know CBDC are used in DeFi, so uh, financial institutions um, would be involved. And we in DeFi, we also have uh, uh, many times uh, uh, governance, uh, decentralized governance, mm. where uh, there is an entity, a type of entity, which is not recognized as a legal entity in, in many countries, but that we call the uh, decentralized autonomous organization, DAO. Um, and uh, so then would you think then in this case that the financial institution would uh, would also uh, at some stage uh, uh, be okay to 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 deal uh, and, and to to interact with dao no i i think for the moment it's going to be really complicated because one of the central points on how the, all the subject that we talk about around uh, crypto, DeFi, and blockchain is the, the, the point of decentralization and it's the point of governance. And uh, me, for me, I'm living in France and uh, we know what is centralization. <laughs> we, we know really what is centralization. And uh, uh, there is a, a big disruption here for people who are deciding. Uh, things and uh, to accept that we can work in the world of decentralization uh, uh, because if you are talking about DAOs, we will ask the point of the governance, we will ask the point of the responsibility. The first uh, thing that we saw on DAOs was in, in 2016 and uh, we all know what happened when someone take uh, 50 million euro, euro out of, of the system. So hopefully the system repair the point, but uh, there is a question of security of the code here uh, sometimes. And uh, and there is a, a question of how you can define who is responsible of uh, of uh, the, the entity of the DAO, uh, who is the issuer, uh, who is the investor, and blah, blah, blah. And so I think for the moment, uh, DeFi, it's a DeFi for flat finance, but using DAOs, I think it's the, the, the second level, so it's it's complicated. Okay. But could ha we could have also in advantages on financing economy on, on, on that point. And we saw that, for example, in United States, using DAO to, um, to make some, uh, some first some uh, financing some new companies it's not really easy and the sec it's negative on that because they requalified the point on, on the security point always mm -hmm. so i think it's it's something that we need to, to to discuss and look at it but i think it's really um, it's really new for the moment and uh, for example in a uh, in uh, in adba financial working group we are working with ADGM in Abu Dhabi because they are more open on the subject of DAOs and DeFi than the European Commission. Mm -hmm. So we did <laughs> we we decentralized the point. Okay, yeah, I see. on that. Okay, yes, and maybe uh, one day uh, Case Depot is, uh, in addition to have shares in in, in an entity may may have some governance uh, shares. <laughs> I mean. Tokens. I don't know. For the moment, it could be difficult, but you know okay. that we, we don't have um, we we don't have shareholder in Casdebo, so we are in, in some kind of decentralization. But okay, the view of the parliament on this. Yeah, if we talk about so these regulation facts, uh, uh, yeah, and, um, uh, Roman, uh, so from the re regulatory affairs of Mastercard. Uh, how would you uh, so see this, this regulation uh, of DeFi? Yeah, so, uh, yeah sorry. Um, no, I think I can agree with a lot that has been said by, by Kai and, and Nadia already in this respect. Um, from, from a regulatory perspective, DeFi uh, is so far really just very hard to capture. Um, there's a broad range of activities and different uh, governance models. Uh, so it's just very hard to define DeFi and then um, yeah, that's also why regulators and policymakers are obviously struggling so far to 
um, you know, detect which rules are actually applicable and and who should be the responsible entities to um, yeah to be imposed on them. So um, and from our perspective, that that is certainly not ideal. It uh, regulatory uncertainty can add another um, you know area of risk to to the DeFi ecosystem. And just in terms of trust, and that's I think what what you ultimately need from all the users. Uh, it would be good to know, and also for supervisors, of course, um, you know what what rules apply, uh, especially if something, for example, goes wrong. So, which fraud or dispute mechanisms are there if you know money is lost or or um, you know other things happen? So, yeah, from my perspective, um, therefore, it's important, but also very difficult to you know create a regulatory framework that really uh, looks at the distinct features of DeFi and also tries to you know achieve the same regulatory outcome not necessarily the same uh, regulatory rules um, for DeFi players so in other words um, of course it's it's obvious that uh, DeFi uses uh, new technologies and new uh, governance models um, but sometimes if you just look at the risks um, they're actually quite similar to traditional financial services so if you look at lending um, broker services exchange services I mean, there's similar risks, just um, it might not be appropriate to use and apply the same rules for those kind of risks. So, yeah, just just from a principle based perspective, I think we need um, yeah, just a regulatory framework that that adjusts the rules as we currently have them. And um, the hard thing probably with regulation of DEFA is, however, um, who is the responsible party? And Nadia was already uh, mentioning that. Um, I mean, we have a lot of governance models and, and there's just not this one entity where you can anchor regulation to. Uh, however, we believe that there's always, I mean, um, certain parties or part, one party that is able to manage the risk um, stemming from DeFi. And of course, that cannot be you know, uh, defined because it will always be different. But in general, regulation should be really you know, anchored with those players. Um, since they are the ones that have the, the input on those systems, and since they are the ones that also reap at least most of the commercial benefits. So, um, yeah, it will be critical to, to uh, actually, and that has been floated by some regulators and policymakers, not to impose uh, regulatory obligations for DeFi and for risk stemming from DeFi on incumbent players, just maybe because they are already regulated and therefore it would be easier and more convenient. But I think we need to find a way to yeah, tailor make regulation and uh, tackle um, you know, those players that really create the risk and have an input on addressing risks as well. Um, yeah, so much I think about the, the, the concept itself. Uh, when it comes to substance of regulation, uh, given you know, attacks and, and fraud and you know, negative things that we've seen in the DeFi space, um, it would certainly be a priority to start with um, you know, clear and high standards of security and compliance for DeFi um, applications and platforms. So uh, strong AML, KYC procedures, also uh, sanctions compliance would be very important. Um, and then of course, as I mentioned before, uh, you really need to have procedures and rules in place on what happens if uh, something goes wrong. If there's fraud, for example, if there's um, you know, disputed transactions, um, I think there we can really look also at traditional finance and in all of these cases you have Procedures where people, you know, know what to do, where you can trust in, and where there's at least, um, you know, a mechanism to solve issues. Uh, with DeFi, I think that's that's very different at the moment, and um, yeah, it's certainly an area to to look into. Um, I think, yeah, and, and I'll stop there. I think what can help, and I think Kai mentioned it as well, is you know, RegTech really helping uh, DeFi players to increase compliance. Um, we at Mastercard, for instance, we also have a crypto compliance arm called uh, Cypher Trace, and they've developed a program which is called DeFi Comply. So that's actually um, yeah, software that helps you prevent uh, transactions to sanctioned addresses, and that's done by integrating real-time compliance data into smart contracts. So um, yeah, that's just one way of you know increasing compliance efforts um, on top of regulation. Uh, regulation at some point will perhaps be needed. But um, RegTech and similar solutions can also increase, um, you know, uh, benefits for DeFi a lot. Okay, thanks, Roman. Um, so my last questions for for Lex, actually. So we've talked a lot about the, the issues on the, the regulation. Uh, Lex, could you uh, try to 
to summarize, uh, you know, which uh, uh, centralized finance problems are solved by decentralized finance. Uh, what are uh, actually the opportunities? Because we've talked a lot about the, uh, the issues, but the, what are the opportunities then? Thanks for the question. Um, it's it's an impossible uh, it's an impossible question. It has no answer. It's like um, we have books. What's the point of websites? Um, yeah. So uh, I think the the first answer is that um, the the shape of financial services is is pretty repeatable through history. Like you don't you don't have to innovate. Uh, a new answer as to what people need. Like people need to save their money. They need to earn an interest rate um, because they want to save. Uh, they they want to borrow money to start a business or you know have access to credit so that they can do uh, some sort of risk transfer. Uh, they need to retire and and save for the future. So I I think it's not the right line of thinking to think about uh, feature comparison, meaning my widget does you know a hundred units of output. Can I find a widget that does a hundred and twenty units of output, and therefore I have done quote unquote digital transformation? So the I think you have to kind of start from a different place, which is where is DeFi being used, by whom, and uh, what is the substrate in which it's being used? So the place where it's being used is uh, on computational blockchains. It's used on Ethereum and various parts of Web3 and so on. What do people do in these places? They live their digital lives. You know, in the, in the same way that people live lives in the, the physical world, we all uh, live in the digital world as well. Um, we have things like social capital, uh, we have things like belonging, identity. Um, we also have things like labor. So working on things that you like uh, or working for money because you need to earn money. All these things are as true in our um, traditional economy as it is in the Web3 economy. However, in the Web3 economy, um, your infrastructure for getting paid how uh, how money transfers to you, your infrastructure for how you save or how you invest or how you borrow, uh, it it doesn't ramp off into the bank. It just doesn't. It's inconvenient. It's like, let's say you get into an Uber and you have cash in your wallet. The Uber driver will kick you out because you have money of the wrong kind. You need to pay the Uber driver with the Uber app, which uses a digital payment method, which has been built for Uber. Uber is a Web2 company, and it's built for the mobile phone. And so the only payments that Uber is going to accept are the payments integrated into the mobile phone rails. Your cash is not acceptable in an Uber. And similarly, in, in the Web3 environment where people are building digital objects that anchor to chains, where they're doing labor um, in exchange, and or you know, they're employed by DAOs, or they are managing money as part of a DAO, or they're creating art and, and purchasing that or exchanging that, or they're participating in markets. All of that is economic activity and it needs banking services. And the banking services are there. They're just called DeFi. That's, that's where they're built. So that's the, the sort of closed loop network of, of the Web3 economy and the financial services that's, that serve it. Now, the, the question is, um, there's two, two questions. The first is, how do things come in and out of there, right? So in the case of Uber that I've described, that cash that you earn, you know, theoretically, it does go into a bank, and then you can load your Apple Pay, and then you can connect your Apple Pay into, uh, into the mobile app, right? So there's an on-ramp for, um, for fiat value into Web2. And so similarly, there are on-ramps and off-ramps into this particularly cl closed-loop environment. And so uh, you have payments on ramps, you have capital markets on ramps, um, and you know th those are valuable and uh, growing interfaces and infrastructure. And you see that both from large traditional financial institutions that are that are getting into capital markets through through custody, digital asset capital markets through custody, um, and then that in turn, once it floats into um, the the Web three ecosystem, can be put to work uh, in DeFi protocols. 
Um, and similarly, there's kind of backwards packaging, right? So um, if a financial institution thinks that tokens are to be packaged and distributed back in traditional wrappers, whether those are uh, funds or trusts or you know other other wrappers, you know that 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 happens as well. Um, so that's kind of one question about the border and the integration and the growing between them. Um, and then I think sort of the third question, which which again to me isn't isn't all that engaging is like, well, which system is more effective at X? Um, which, which is better at performing on some particular arbitrary um, characteristic? You know, And I think it's very easy to point to various blockchain powered solutions that aren't encumbered by uh, traditional uh, system integrations, you know, integrations into Fiserv or Temenos or uh, the, the card networks or anything like that. And, and it, in those cases, it's very easy to say that the Web3 systems are meaningfully, I mean, endlessly um, more economic. But at the same time, it's also easy to tell the story that once you start to plug in these blockchain-based systems into the technology stack of traditional financial institutions who have you know, 50 or 100 things working together, adding the 51st thing isn't going to reduce your cost. So I think the, the cost improvement story is, is a bit tenuous. It's a hard one to pull out value and to, to use it to be persuasive. But once you understand that that's not the real story, the real story is about economic activity, about where people are performing that economic activity, and then what are the tools that they're using for financial products where those financial products are exactly the same as they've always been just built in a different way on different, um, on different value chains, then I think you start to get to interesting insights. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks for your input. Uh, we have a number of questions uh, in the Pigeon Hall, actually. Uh, so the first one we, we, we have already uh, partially answered it, uh, which was about you know uh, the the issue of the collapse of uh, Terra Luna and uh, you know what would uh, what were the benefits of, <laughs> of it or after the, you know, the, the the major issue of uh, for many people who, who lost money. Uh, so we are, we underline that uh, regulation you know uh, maybe uh, you know, was going to be. Uh, maybe put in place faster than 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 before. You know, after such a big uh, issue. Uh, any other input from the you in, among you for this question? So besides regulation, uh, I mean, what you know, faster regulation. What would be the the benefits of uh, such a big collapse? Are, are we talking? Yes. Mm -hmm. Ron, uh, next part. Uh, sorry, are we talking about the Terra Luna? Uh, yes, so the, the Terra reasons Luna for Terra Luna, or like the benefits of seeing it implode? What's the? Yeah, I mean the first question, you know, you know the the Terra Luna collapse in the context of DeFi and the purported benefits. So yeah, so that, that question is phrased a little bit strangely, right? So um, there there are no benefits to watching people lose forty billion dollars. Um, I think there may be lessons, um, and I think there may be takeaways. So I, it, it, this is a really hairy topic, and um, it's super important to be extremely careful about uh, kind of conflating different things. That I and I see people doing this all the time because it's convenient and it's nice and it feels good. Um, but the the things to pull apart are Terra Luna was a particular protocol with a particular stable coin design that was um that was a crypto native um crypto native failure meaning it was um a blockchain protocol that had an algorithmically designed stable coin which also had a um a mechanism meant to attract people that was recursive and it was self-referential and um, it attracted people exponentially. And then when it was attacked, it collapsed exponentially. Um, if we give it um, the benefit of the doubt, which you may or may not, you know, in, in, the, in the negative case, it was a grift and the whole thing was a scam and a fraud. And that's easy to think about. In the, in the positive case, we can, we can say that perhaps there was 
uh, like an honest mistake in the engineering of the mechanisms um, where the hypothesis was that the stable coin would be backed by the gas token of the underlying blockchain protocol. We know those are valuable from Ethereum and Bitcoin. Um, and we've seen, you know, MakerDAO, for example, use um, Ethereum as collateral. And so, you know, the question is, does the bundling of those things work or not? Um, and the answer that we've seen play out in the economic experiment is that it, it does not work because it can be attacked and it's recursive. And so that's the nicest thing you can say about that sort of substantive collapse. Um, just because something fails doesn't mean that the category fails. That's like a, a, a mental mistake, right? Just because a mortgage-backed security is poorly priced doesn't mean that there shouldn't be or aren't mortgage-backed securities. Just because internet companies were expensive and pets.com failed doesn't mean there weren't going to be internet companies. So you can't draw the conclusion that because Terra Luna was poorly designed, all crypto economic designs are poor. So that's kind of number one. And then the second lesson that we've learned is that Terra Luna collapse created a black hole, a, a large capital markets loss. And the central, the traditional broker dealers, the, the centralized exchanges, and I don't mean centralized as a negative word, it's just a just description of the traditionally shaped companies like FTX, like DCG, like Three Arrows Capital, like Celsius, like Voyager, Voyager publicly traded. Um, things that looked like a broker dealer or an exchange that were very, very familiar to any regulator um, had exposure to this asset in the same way that Lehman had exposure to mortgage-backed securities. And then it was an absolutely you know, horrible controls in those companies, lots of compliance failures, you know, in the best case, uh, naive underperformance, in, in the worst case, outright fraud. But there was a financial, you know, this black hole spread because of uh, borrowing between all of the capital markets desks. And there was hidden leverage that blew everybody up in a financial liquidation cascade that looked uh, very much like 2008. So I think the if we do talk about regulation relating to this, it's regulation around the financial players that are trying to intermediate access to crypto. So brokers, exchanges, market makers, asset managers, you know, whether they trade in crypto or whether they trade in some other asset doesn't really matter. We should have the same controls around them. Um, but I think as it relates to the, the technology and the architecture, the, we, we don't have as easy um, a conclusion. I think we have to be very careful about conflating the two things together. Okay, thanks for your input. So the second question uh, with uh, many votes is about the intermediaries in the traditional finance. Um, so they, in the traditional finance, they may uh, provide you know, uh, another layer of accountability verification uh, in decentralized finance. Um, uh, there is a question on you know, what, uh, what would what would be if something is missing you know if uh, if the decentralized parties are not uh, present and uh, the yeah, the question is about uh, uh, so intermediaries uh, uh, are depicted in the defi you know by, by the people who believe in defi uh, things that intermediaries in the traditional finance uh, just take rents or take some some uh, ease uh, in between, uh, but uh, so they, they provide also according to, to the, the the person who wrote the question, uh, they provide also some uh, other uh, benefits like accountability verification. So uh, any anybody wants to to add something about that? You know? Perhaps uh, if you may, uh, Jean-Marc. Uh... Yes, Nadia. I think there is something uh, uh, that is uh, a little pleasant that even in DeFi, we have a lot of intermediaries, not traditional ones. And in a world where there is a possibility of profit, there is always intermediaries. So I think the, the way that some people think that all will be totally decentralized without any intermediaries or any people who are trying to have some rents there, it's not true. And what we are looking in the, the economy of the DeFi, even in the DAOs, that there is so, 
always someone here to to have a rent. And um, the DeFi is not really uh, decentralized for me. So you cannot. Uh, uh, some people can try to to uh, to enter the DeFi without intermediaries, but it's not so true. And um, so the the traditional intermediaries and the, the constraint that we have when we are in the traditional finance and that we will have, I think, in DeFi and uh, like in crypto, it's that you provide accountability and verification, and you provide security, you provide uh, KYC and IML on, on what uh, you are doing and between the, the people who are transacting here. Mm -hmm. And so for the moment, if the system don't know how to uh, verify concretely the identities and to, to provide this kind of securities, we will always have intermediaries. Okay, yes. And also, the, uh, the not the, the first question, but the, the fourth question uh, is about uh, mm -hmm. you know the smart contracts and uh, should they be verified? Uh, some people in, in, in the domain, you know, say that you, you shouldn't uh, uh, trust, you should verify, but that's true for people who don't know the technology. Uh, it's, it's very difficult to, to mm -hmm. verify uh, smart contracts. Uh, a question about CBDC. Uh, the third one, can CBDCs be used in the metaverse? So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, first question is, you know, what is the definition of the metaverse? <laughs> because mm -hmm. it could be you know, the, the real world uh, augmented with, uh, with, with uh, digital data. Uh, but uh, if you mean that, you know, like uh, a CBDC as a crypto, uh, as we said before, uh, CBDCs are, are not, uh, are not uh, used uh, in, um, in DeFi uh, so far because there, are no, uh, uh, there is no retail CBDC uh, used uh, in the system so far, uh, but when, they, if at, at some stage they are used, you know, if they are used in, in um, decentralized finance, of course, uh, they could be used in the metaverse because in the metaverse, as we uh, understand it as, a, as, for example, a virtual world where uh, you have some ownership of digital uh, assets and the digital assets are maybe non-fungible tokens, very close to to cryptocurrencies, uh, so they can be inside uh, protected by the same crypto wallet. So yes, I mean, at some stage, if there is a CBDC in DeFi, yes, in the metaverse, I think it could be used. Uh, Nadia, you had a question about, uh, you know, like uh, case de depot uh, opportunities uh, yeah, in, in, yeah, other, in countries. other countries. Yes. <laughs> I'm just working for case de depot in France. I have another role in Morocco, but but as a board member of digital agency of the government, so and it's totally different of my job. So um, I I don't know if there is opportunities of collaboration. What I can say is that because the Depot of Morocco is working on the subject of, of blockchain and crypto assets, and for example, the Central Bank of Morocco is uh, is working on the a project to launch to launch a CBDC uh, to. Uh, as an answer of the the, 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 minister, the the minister of finance who asked them to work on that. So I know they are working a lot on, on, on this subject. Uh, Tunisia work on, on the subject more in the in the central bank issue also. Uh, and for others, I don't know. Because uh, the depot collaborate with the others because the depot, but I, I don't know their project. Okay, thanks for, for your answer. Uh, we are close to uh, the end of the session. Um, so we had a, a question on, you know, what, what is the reference architecture for DeFi? Uh, actually, this is one of the new reports we are working on as part of the, of the work stream. Uh, anybody uh, who has some knowledge uh, can join uh, the DCGI and uh, join us to... Uh, to give an answer to this question, and maybe in the next uh, next conference uh, we will have uh, a, a more detailed answer, which is actually uh, would be would take a lot of time, I think, to to detail because uh, of course the architecture is, is not uh, so simple. Um, so thanks to all the speakers uh, for your input; uh, it was uh, very insightful. Um, today, it's, the conference DC3 is not finished. Uh, at 4 p.m., we will have uh, uh, 
uh, another session uh, more uh, on details on uh, proof of reserve, which is uh, uh, which will be presented by uh, Chainlink, uh, a company providing providing oracles uh, in in, uh, in decentralized finance. And so we'll discuss this, uh, this question of, you know, uh, are the reserves of stable coins uh, real or uh, there is no, not enough reserve? Uh, also proof of liabilities will be discussed. And uh, another, uh, an, another detailed session will be on the signed non-fungible tokens. Uh, so also a question of trustworthiness of, uh, of NFTs, if they are uh, trustworthy or not. So at 4 p.m., so there is a, a short break. And uh, so I thanks again all the, the speakers. Uh, thanks for the questions by the audience. And um, see you next time. So at the next DC3 uh, conference and uh, go, come back also for at 4 p.m. for the next session. Thank you, Jean-Marc. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Thank you.